What's happening? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we are recording locally. Sorry to the internet. You will see this later. If anybody watches these things. Um, cool. Welcome. I am pulling up the agenda. The agenda is in the chat. So this is the last call before the phase zero spec freeze. Um, we are working hard on the last few PRs on some known stuff that we want to get in. Um, in general, uh, the intention here is to be feature complete, um, to not be uh, just meddling with things to make them cleaner. We're trying to clean up everything before. Um, and to really get it in a stable place for implementers, uh, auditors, formal verification people, buzzing, et cetera, to, um, to dig in. Um, obviously, three out of the four of those people, uh, the intention is to find issues. So if we have issues, um, if they're relatively minor bugs, we're going to be releasing via minor releases. Uh, we're also going to continue our testing efforts. Uh, so we're going to be releasing, you know, V080 T1, T2, if we're incrementing just on testing and not substantive things. So that would just be increasing the test vectors for y'all. Um, if the t increasing in test vectors found some minor bug, we will fix the minor bug and release as a minor version. Um, for on the on the audits and formal verification stuff, uh, there might be some structural things that come up. There might be uh, some deeper change where uh, maybe some sort of ab uh, additional abstraction uh, is warranted for X, Y, or Z. Um, we will deal with those on a case by case basis as they come up. Um, potentially releasing as semi major versions um, if it's small, isolated, and worthwhile getting out, um, or potentially piling on a few of these and, and maybe after a long run uh, of feedback, maybe on, on the more of the three, four month time horizon, we would do a semi-major uh, version bump. But again, I don't know what those are because we, we haven't found them yet. Uh, so we will uh, address them as they come. Cool. Spec freeze, it's happening. Um, thank you, everyone. I think uh, the amount of people that contributed to this is pretty awesome and unbelievable. If you find issues, keep uh, contributing and fixing them upstream. Okay, on to the first item of the agenda. Uh, testing. Is Dietrich here? You wanna give us an update? Yes. Just a short update. So there's this PR open that's basically aims to complete the spec test coverage. There's these two uh, open issues remaining, one for uh, how we formalize the uh, finalization and how we uh, deal with the bit field. There's really just ways of representing data and hope to complete the test for these two edge cases uh, rather soon. And all the other tests are complete, so we get uh, much higher coverage of the spec. Great. Thanks. So there'll be much more test vector coverage with the coming release. Um, I believe that there is uh, fuzzing of the Pi spec and the Go spec still ongoing. It's correct? still ongoing. We've been trying to improve the how we move on from our initial set of states to like a more diverse set of states. The difficult thing here is that it's not like a virtual machine where there's many, many different uh, input states. The input states are like relatively sparse because there's all these invariants that have to be met by the state. So what we do is we manually create input states, but then first the block changes. And then when there's a valid post state, we continue from there. And so we expand and expand the, the output states. This, it, the difficult thing here is to 
limited in an intelligent way to not overflow the, this pre-state collection. We want meaningful uh, states or a diverse set of states, not like small changes. If you're interested in such thing, please do join the uh, like the Telegram chat or the Gitter channel, and we can talk more about the effort. Great, thanks. Any other updates uh, on tests? Yep. Can you give a link to the Telegram chat? Uh, maybe in the agenda? Yeah, we'll pop it in uh, this chat. Cool. Okay, any other testing updates? No, that's it. Great. Uh, let's move on to client updates. We will start with Trinity today. Hello. Um, so the um, uh, yes, uh, we just joined um, the uh, yes Python teams uh, Snake Commerce retreat and had a great week in Bubbler to discuss and uh, play around the new um, Python libraries. We plan to migrate from Async IO to Trio, uh, which is another Python asynchronous library. And the, the recent most important um, progress is that Alex has a huge PR for the uh, version 0 0.7.1. And also since the spec bridge is coming, so we plan to uh, bump to version um, 0 0.8 altogether. Yep, um, I think that's all, unless uh, Alex, do you have anything to comment? No, that's it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. How about Harmony? Hi. We have updated our client uh, to the latest spec, uh, 0 0.7.1, uh, including SSZ Union. Uh, we are passing all tests uh, from GitHub. And our benchmark shows no significant performance changes six, uh, since 0 0.6 version of spec. Also, we have added validator RPC uh, server part. Uh, we will add client part someday in the future. And we are working uh, on libp 2 p minimal implementation. Uh, we are porting it to Java. And we have finished CKIO part and moving forward. And next, uh, we are going to add persistence to our client. Uh, and, and that's all, I think, yeah. Great, thanks. How about Lodestar? Yeah. Uh, we've been uh, building out a few last kind of stubbed pieces of the client. Um, things like getting a valid ETH data, ETH1 data uh, for creating a new block, uh, getting our deposit processing actually working with the real Merkle tree, um, and syncing, uh, getting a real sync between a network and uh, a chain going um, and we're still in the process of moving to 0 0.7.1 of the spec uh, and we're also working on getting a benchmarking uh, chassis set up so, yeah cool cool is there uh, I think last time y'all were discussing, uh, experimenting with some, some TypeScript conversions. Uh, is that still on the horizon? Yeah. Um, so oh, uh, assembly, script? assembly script. Yeah. Right, um, right. So we're, uh, so we have kind of a rough uh, implementation of an LMD ghost. It's, we haven't integrated it into the 
into the code yet. It's, it's still as a PR. Uh, and we are also thinking about um, doing uh, SSZ or rewriting SSZ with assembly script. I think the kind of the blocker there is uh, a SHA-2 implementation. Um, and so those are still works in progress. I think, I think they're going to take a little bit of time, um, but we're, 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 we're still working. We're like, that's still, uh, I guess, a priority. Cool. Thank you. How about uh, Prismatic? Hey, guys. Um, yeah, we're passing all the V0.7.1 spec tests except for one final one that we're working on today. Um, we uh, finished our Go as a Z. It's passing as well all the spec tests. And the next thing up is we're going to be fixing up every part of our runtime so that it matches all the core changes and ensure that we can optimize benchmark and improve the client itself. Um, we unfortunately spent a bunch of time working on uh, transforming the YAMLs because they use uh, hex strings to represent uh, binary data instead of uh, base64. So just a lot of hiccups um, basically on, you know, for, uh, based, on, based on that. Um, but things are good now. Uh, aside from that, we put together a central repo for Ethereum 2.0 API schemas. Um, we'll be sharing with that. Um, we're not going to chat about this on this call, so we don't want to take time away. But oh, Terrence already sent it over the uh, over the chat. Um, yeah, maybe Preston can give a little bit of uh, like a really brief um, explanation of this repo uh, for everyone. Yeah. So the the goal here is we just want to give feedback and sort of collect together these API schemas so that people wanting to build on Ethereum 2.0 have one place to go to. Uh, this could be going into uh, upstream into the spec repo or live here. We don't really have a preference now, but we wanted to start getting feedback on this idea. So like Rose said, don't want to take too much time on this call because it's not on the agenda, but let us know afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Thank you. About Artemis. Um, pass. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm five ETH poorer now due to um, my uh, asshole teammates um, beating me in the bet and um, upgrading from V5.1 to V7.1 of the spec. So um, I think that's in the like first five time. days. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the first time we've actually been like um, up to date this spec. Uh, so, you know, interpret that how you will. Um, but but they they really did a good job. So that was awesome. Um, we are um, also working on um, some stuff with deposits, tweaking that a whole process, um, incorporating some feedback received from the uh, Hobbit spec. Um, there's some good uh, comments about, you know, like some cases it was, there was, it needed to be a little bit simpler, like for its purpose and um, some more mods to match like um, other implementations so that um, it's less work to use it. And then also matching, um, you know, the, the actual real bio protocol. Um, and, and really I, um, a lot of credit goes to, um, uh, Dean and, and Renee actually for volunteering their time to like rewrite the spec and it, it was um, it was a little bit it was spread out over some documents and and they they both um, uh, kind of took all of the information incorporated it made a new um, much better um, version of it so so that was super cool and I think that's pretty much it cool congrats on taking Johnny's <laughs> How about parody? Uh, so, uh, so last week we also updated to uh, seven one test, uh, uh, which we are really happy to see all the the, the bugs are fixed and we are, we are able to remove all our uh, workarounds. So that's really great. And uh, for this week we are. Uh, we did some uh, fix for our errors in uh, Rocks DB, so it's more stable now. And we did a major uh, overhaul for our binary Marco uh, library, 
which uh, uh, still hasn't been integrated, uh, but we have a library. And uh, the, the subject network stack is still in the works. So that's for us. Cool. Yeah, thanks for um, finding some of those bugs. Um, Lighthouse. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we're at the moment passing all of the 0.6.3 tests uh, and we've decided not to keep up to date with the 0.7.1 uh, and we're going to wait straight for the uh, spec freeze and, and then jump straight to that one. Uh, and since the spec freeze is happening, we've uh, also decided to start doing releases and so we're targeting a version 0.0.1 .0 release of Lighthouse next month, which will of course still be just for developers and researchers. Um, so instead of uh, doing all of the spec updates for 0.7, we've been working on things like uh, the reduced tree fork choice that was discussed at IC3, uh, and we're seeing already some good uh, speed improvements with that, around you know sort of five times faster than our previous implementation without any significant overheads, which is great. Um, but we haven't got any direct benchmarking to sort of show that yet, but uh, we should expect that expect that soon. Um, on the networking front, we've been making some great progress with um, our libpd implementation and especially disk discovery version 5. Uh, we're proud to say we have uh, discovery version 5 running in Lighthouse at the moment doing discovery, although it's uh, still just uh, an in initial implementation for our purposes and it's not the full spec yet. Uh, and also we've been having a chat to the uh, Apache Milagro maintainers and we're going to start be pushing um, pushing some fixes and some some stuff up to them as well because that's our uh, our core BLS library. Uh, yeah, and that's Lighthouse. Great. On the Discovery V5, are you doing any of the um, advertising kind of topic discovery yet or just the base underneath that? I'll let Adrian answer that one. Uh, yeah, just base discovery at the moment. I uh, haven't done the advertising stuff yet. Cool, cool. Thanks. Um, how about Nimbus? Hi. So uh, regarding specs, we have most of 0.7.1 implemented, and we also updated our um, test suite with the official test vectors for uh, BLS, shuffling, and the um, integer part of SSZ. Uh, regarding specs, the uh, focus uh, for the upcoming weeks will be uh, on performance, uh, implementing uh, SOS style SSZ to enable the rest of your official tests. And um, we are currently, uh, we will start refactoring the state transition because um, with uh, 0 0.7, uh, now we have names uh, for all the state transition function like uh, process slot, process blocks, um, and things like this. And uh, with that, we will also refactor the mocking part of uh, the test suite, like uh, b mocking blocks um, on state. Uh, now, beyond the core spec, uh, we continue uh, working on our uh, async library uh, because we we forked uh, NIM async library and uh, we had uh, more and more function to support peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking. Uh, we also launched our uh, lib2p daemon-based uh, testnet uh, last week. So now we have testnet zero based on RPX and testnet one based on libp 2 p uh, We will do a blog post, uh, probably not uh, this week, but um, a little, uh, maybe two weeks from now, uh, to explain uh, how to install everything. We still are, are, are running out some details. Um, we have Ethereum one deposit contract watcher ready. Uh, we did encounter some issues with log filtering and some RPC methods uh, that uh, are not intuitive on the Ethereum one. And uh, also, uh, other team at the Status um, uh, now have a lot of interest on Ethereum two now that it's uh, being stabilized. And uh, Jacques uh, Wagner, uh, the main dev of uh, Viper. Uh, started to use uh, NIM uh, as a Iwasm contract uh, generator. So I'm posting the, uh, the thread uh, in, uh, in the chat. 
so NIM uh, might become like uh, official IWASM uh, uh, with official facilities. And also we are starting to talk with the Embark team at Status so that uh, 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 each team knows uh, what are the challenges of um, developing dApps and uh, of Ethereum 2 for the Embark team. And that's it for us. Great, thanks. And last but not least, Yeef. Yo, um, so no real updates from us. We kind of stopped working on it while the spec was still rolling. I think we did some refactoring stuff since the last time I was here. Um, and then once the spec is frozen, I'm going to try uh, catch to seven point whatever faster than Artemis did just to like get some clout there. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. Challenge accepted. You want to make, you want to make another bit, Dean? I'm a one-man show and I'm going to beat you. <laughs> Dude, it's not hard to beat our team, man. Stop bragging. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Welcome back, Dean. Um, cool. Did I miss anybody? Perfect. Well, actually, um, Dejun Park is here. He is not working on a client, but he has begun um, a formal verification effort in formalizing the Beacon Chain in K. Adrian, do you want to give us just a little update on that? Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Dejun. Um, yeah, so we started this formal modeling of this um, client, essentially, state transition function. And a month ago and uh yeah so far we are trying to understand the details and rational in the line into the hood and then yeah now we are starting to actually modeling in k uh, k framework and uh yeah that's what i what you have right now cool thanks glad to have you I would love to have like uh, maybe uh, uh, in a month or two, uh, 10 or 20 minute session about um, uh, how easy did you find the Ethereum 2 spec um, and uh, compared to maybe Ethereum 1. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Are you, are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Of course, because yes. uh, most of us have been working on that for a year now, and uh, uh, it was hard at first. Uh, I guess uh, now uh, we are uh, uh, kind of uh, insensitive to <laughs> how <laughs> hard it is. Right. But uh, I when made, we have new people, I made it. Uh, did you, did you all end up using that accompanying document I sent you? Was that helpful? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. yeah. yeah, so I made an accompanying document explaining a lot of things. Um, and I want to refine it and figure out a good place for it to live. Because without it, it's definitely uh, confusing. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so, yeah, you will, will, will do that uh, once you're at the, at, the, at the point. Cool, cool. Um, great. So uh, let's move on. We have, I think, a number of I think we have some Wasm people. We have the have research team. Um, research updates. Who wants to start? Um, so let's see. On the phase one side, I uh, wrote up a uh, small definitely incomplete checklist of uh, things that we might want to consider changing or at least we'll have to decide what we'll have to decide on for phase one I think it's the most uh, recent issue in the um, issues uh, list at the moment uh, so the big one uh, the big ones uh, there that I can uh, think of so one of them is uh, just uh, shard block time uh, 
So is it uh, going to be uh, what the same as the beacon block time, half a beacon block, quarter of a beacon block, something else? Um, the second is uh, just size of a beacon block. Uh, the third is uh, exactly how the crosslink uh, data, uh, or another one is how crosslink data works. Um, I also want to uh, consider removing the um, attestation list and basically only having one attestation object, or at least pushing the data from the one attestation object up into the header. And the reasoning basically being that I'm not really convinced that there's a particular need to in to, to to have space for more than one attestation because the 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 set of things that we're using these uh, shard attestations for is much less than the um, the equivalent set for a beacon, for beacon attestations and uh, there's a couple of other smaller ones so i guess uh, if anyone wants to uh, take a look at that list then uh, and none of it's ur uh, urgent, but once phase zero is frozen, I do expect that we would that we'd want to kind of move full steam ahead on uh, getting the phase one spec finalized. So it's definitely good to start uh, looking at. Um, so that's phase one. On the phase two side, uh, the main thing is um, I mean I've been talking to the phase two research peop uh, people on, um, on and off and trying to figure out uh, like basically how fee markets would, would, would work and uh, some of the issues around uh, batching transactions um, and uh, this is more on ETH, re uh, more on ETH research, uh, batching transactions, how to ma make sure this game is censorship resistant, um, how to make sure we actually get the efficiency gains from batching and so forth. Um, the, so I think what we're, the kind of concrete possible changes to the uh, basic execution environments, or sorry, the basic phase two spec that seem likely uh, one of them is uh, changing it so that you can have multiple uh, beacon chain uh, or multiple top level transactions in one shard block. One of them is uh, all allowing larger shard, uh, execution environment states. So instead of 32 bytes, I mean, you could still have 32 bytes, but you could pay more and potentially go all the way up to something like 32 kilobytes. So basically, the upper limit being like, it's something that still needs to be small enough to fit into a beacon block for a fraud for a fraud proof, um, but otherwise it can be larger. And it being larger has a lot of uh, really nice benefits. So like uh, you can have uh, some some level of proof batching happen between blocks. You can have uh, some level of batching happen. Uh, even if there, or you can have uh, multiple uh, transactions uh, get with Merkle proofs get created independently, both get in, uh, get included without either either of them breaking, uh, as well as some other things. Uh, so that's nice. Um, by the way, Carl, are you on the uh, floor? Are you on the call? Um, well, if not, then uh, Carl has been uh, doing some uh, wonderful thinking around. What, 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 taking uh, Plasma-like ideas and applying them to an ETH2 context where data just gets published on chain. And it turns out that you can do that to do some uh, really nice things like uh, potentially yeah, make, do cross shard transactions much more easily, um, improve efficiency a lot. Theoretically, you might, you would, in the normal case, you might not even need to publish Merkle proofs into the, into the chain. Uh, one of the really nice ones was that if you stagger shard, uh, shard block times and add a protocol where validators like, pre-declare when, when they're going to make a shard block very soon, then you can achieve uh, kind of extremely fast uh, de facto uh, con uh, confirmation times for any application, uh, even if the, shard, the individual shard block times are still uh, longer, like four seconds or, or even eight or whatever. Uh, so I mean, that's... And that's on ETH research. That's something I'm also potentially really excited about because it lets us have create basically user experience equivalents to all these more centralized platforms without us actually being more centralized. So yay. 
Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you, Vitalik. Uh, Justin? Yeah, so I only have just one, one update. Uh, basically, um, I was at ZCon and uh, Vitalik was at ZCon and there was this excitement for um, a new curve. Uh, which was introduced uh, with uh, Zexi called uh, BLS12377. So it's kind of similar to BLS12381. It has the same embedding degree of 12, but it has a slightly uh, different uh, bit size of uh, 377. And the reason why there's excitement is because you can do efficient um, uh, snark proofs about snarks. So you have this this one level of recursion is not like a, a f infinite recursion, but at least one level. Um, and then you can also do efficient snark proofs about uh, signatures. Um, so one of the things we were considering is whether or not we should uh, move to this uh, new curve, which has this, this, this interesting property. Um, I guess the the bad news is that um, BLS twelve three seventy seven is is a bit more than just changing parameters and 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 constants. Um, so there is a little bit of work to um, to take the existing implementations and port them over. Um, the other downside is that there's a it, it, it has a cost um, in terms of hash to G two. So that becomes a bit more expensive. Um, so I think at this point in time, pragmatically speaking, uh, we're looking to to stick with BLS twelve three eighty one, you know, which has more maturity, more infrastructure, more testing, and by sticking with BLS twelve three eighty one, we also um, uh, you know can can meet the the DevCon uh, suggestion of launching the the deposit contract um, during a, a public ceremony. Um, so I guess uh, it will be interesting to see how this how this space kind of evolves in the future. I, I mean, it's 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 mind-boggling how much uh, improvement we're seeing um, over time, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's new suggestions that that come up, you know, this year and next year. So maybe. You know, during phase one or phase two, we could uh, potentially evaluate a change to uh, to to a new curve. But I'd say in the short term, uh, stick with BLS twelve three eighty one. So does that mean that um, uh, because there is currently a BLS standardization effort, but uh, it means that the community might be fragmented between uh, standardization on uh, 381 and 377, right? Yeah. So one of the you know the the things that needs to be done is kind of make sure the standard standardization effort that everyone is on the same page. Um, it seems that where the of you know of the other blockchain projects that are looking to uh, launch with uh, such a curve, we're the first one we want to deploy. Um, so there's about ten, maybe ten different blockchain projects, and we're the first one um, who would deploy the deposit contract. Um, you know, the, the the Ethereum does have a little bit of weight in the space and momentum, so. Um, it, it's possible, you know, that the, the mere fact that, that we do go ahead with BLS well through two one might be enough of an incentive for others to come in. One thing that was, uh, you know, voiced during the the standardization meetings is that other people also want, you know, no fragmentation and and, and cohesiveness. So we'll see what the next meeting uh, come up comes comes up with, um, which is in, in a bit less than two weeks. Um, but yeah, for sure, um, we don't want fragmentation. Although what that does sound like is that there will be some level of fragmentation, especially going off further into the future, whether anyone wants it or not. Like basically, because if we expect to keep on finding better and better curves that have 
uh, more and more capa uh, capabilities in them. So you, and you start with one that has uh, one level of uh, full recursion with pairings, and you might find one that has two levels of recursion. Eventually, someone might might find a cycle, then someone might find a more efficient curve with a cycle. So it's. Uh, I uh, guess uh, there's there's definitely a high probability that we should be preparing for an elliptic curve world that continues being a messy one for the next decade or pretty much all the way up until quantum computers nuke the whole space. Mm. So one of the things we're trying to do with the standardization effort is to have the notion of a cipher suite. Um, so a little bit of metadata which specifies you know, which curve you're using, et cetera, which hash function. And so um, I guess this is maybe a good test of the robustness of the cipher suite. You know, can, how well does it work with the, the existing curves that we know of? Um, the IETF standardization effort is not just for the blockchain project. So they will be interested in uh, standardizing all the various uh, meaningful options. Um, so, I guess that's good news for us because it, it, it means that we have some level of preparedness uh, in this possible messy world of lots of different curves. Yep. Cool. Thank you, Justin. Um, Leo raised his hand. What's up, Leo? Uh, yes, just a very quick uh, uh, note. Um, so um, from Bar from Barcelona, I have been uh, contact from the Starkware uh, team, uh, and they showed some interest on in working with the with the simulator. Uh, and the idea would be to uh, study how various um, network parameters are affected by uh, block size. Uh, yeah, this is in the context of the Ethereum Improvement Proposal 2028. Um, yeah, so that. I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Um, let's do a EWASM update and then get an update from Quilt. Uh, hey. Um, the, the last month has been really busy. Um, probably many of you have seen that we released a tool called Scout, uh, which is a black box prototyping environment for uh, for phase two execution. It uses WASM internally. It was based on uh, Vitalik's phase two proposal two. There is a each research post explaining, well, introducing Scout and giving some background. Um, just look for Scout on each research. Um, and the code itself can be found on eWASM slash Scout. Um, now, this black boxes, um, most of the phase zero and phase one stuff, except what is required. And basically it is a tool uh, which operates on a YAML test file. Um, and it can execute execution environments um, using that YAML test file. And the shard blocks can be defined as well as the WASM code for the execution environment. And the main goal with, uh, with this design is to be able to quickly prototype different uh, features in execution environments and be able to benchmark uh, those features. Um, now, initially, we have implemented a couple of different uh, execution environments with different basic functionality. So we do have a Snipes verification, which is integrated with Socrates. Uh, we do have BLS signature verification. Um, and some code for a token contract, some examples. And all of these are really nice uh, to prove that all these features can be implemented and compiled to WASM. Um, but actually right now we are focusing on the more important questions. And there are basically two important questions. Uh, is the speed uh, of all this WASM code and the throughput uh, of what the uh, execution environments have to do? Um, and basically, the, the, the key part execution environments have to work on is they have to get a witness for a state, and they have to verify that witness, um, and then they need to apply the changes on it. Um, <clears throat> so our first goal right now is to prototype uh, 
this witness verification, so one, uh, one way to do that is using SSZ partials. Uh, we haven't have that implemented yet, but that is one of the next steps. And the main outcome we hope to get out of uh, this um, witness benchmarking is to prove that a stateless model is the right direction. And that is the first thing we have to prove. Um, now, since, as I mentioned, this black box is uh, pretty much everything from phase zero and phase one, uh, because we don't need it for benchmarking. Um, but we do need to, to have that at some way uh, supported to, to have a proper uh, infrastructure to test execution environments. Um, so the, the other goal outside of the, the benchmarking we're doing is it would be nice to get uh, this functionality implemented in a, a proper E2 client. Um, and such a client would also need to implement uh, a lot of the phase one spec, um, as well as whatever is needed based on this phase two proposal. Um, the eWASM team is, is uh, uh, working together with, with the, uh, the Quilt team. So I think we're gonna talk a bit more about this part, um, but it would be nice uh, to have a execution only test net at some point uh, to be able to, to have proper hands-on experience with execution environments. Um, that, that, is, that is my update. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Um, someone from the Quilt team? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead. Cool, cool. Um, so uh, I guess number one, I, um, I worked on a wiki uh, this past week, and so I'm actually posting it here in the chat. Um, so this covers a lot of the glossary terms, um, a lot of the material, a lot of the current conversations, and basically consolidates all the info on um, so far on phase two in, in one spot. And so um, I'd like to get this on the Ethereum GitHub wiki, but I'm, I'm not sure the best place to put it up. Um, so maybe, Danny, if you have a suggestion there. Um, I'll take a look at it. We can throw it into either that new ETH wiki or onto, uh, it might get more eyes on it if we put it in the stack repo, but with a big asterisk, it's just like for research and implementation. Um, but I'll take a look at it and make a, we can make a call after. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that works. Um, other things on our front, um, uh, you know, we've been collaborating with um, the, the EWASM team on, on various things. So um, one thing that uh, we've been doing is uh, trying to support Scout. And so um, we've, uh, we've been working on implementing SSC partials in, in Rust and helping with that effort. Um, also, uh, we've continued to dive into kind of the theory and some of the um, ideas behind the, the relay market. I think, you know, Vitalik talked about that. Um, that's, there's a discussion there on ETH research, so we're kind of thinking about that a little bit deeper. Um, and there's, there's been good conversation there. Um, another, another thing is uh, what uh, Alex just mentioned. Um, we are uh, looking to help um, basically get a phase, uh, phase one uh, test net up that can support a certain number of shards that we can uh, integrate uh, Scout into um, and a basic execution, um, basic execution engine from that. Uh, so we can start having playgrounds with execution environments um, that, that can be, and, and a number of assumptions can be tested and, and benchmarked and explored. Um, also from our front, uh, we're um, in a kind of a transitionary phase. So we will um, have more of an official roadmap here soon. So I think on, on the next call, um, there'll be some other things that, um, that we're looking at expanding on and, and diving into um, and contributing on. So that's, that's everything from Quilt so far. Great, thank you. Um, Super excited to see pretty much all three phases moving in parallel at this point.
Cool, cool. Um, let's see, maybe the Pegasus research team. Is there any update from y'all? Uh, yes. Sir. So we had submitted the handle paper to Usenix and we got accepted to phase two with some commands uh, to take into account. So there will be a new version of the paper in August uh, without any change in the algorithm result, just uh, something easier to read, I would say. Uh, so that's paperwork. And something that we're working on right now, uh, we're looking at how to use rollups uh, for Ethereum 2 as a way to execute transactions on any shard from any rollup. So uh, it's the beginning for us. Uh, we're going to look at the simple case first, which is transfer between rollups. And uh, we have one proposal ready. Uh, and we're going to discuss that with Barry White Hat uh, next week and to see how we can uh, merge uh, the efforts. And that's it. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, any other research updates before we move on? Cool. Uh, networking. Uh, we have a couple guys from uh, Protocol Labs here today. Any updates from your end? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, pardon me if there's noise in the background. I'm at a conference. Uh, but yeah, Raul and I are here. Um, we so here's our update. Um, we, we we basically we uh, don't have any update on grants yet. We're very close to uh, make making a couple grants. Uh, some in, in conjunction with other uh, funding sources. Some um, on our own. Uh, so we'll probably have an announcement about that next week. But all of them are aimed at building uh, lib P2P implementations in the languages that all of the client folks on this call need. Um, so they should be, this should be encouraging announcements and I think they'll, they'll bear fruit by September uh, when we need them. Um, the second thing, and then we can, people can ask questions or, or whatever, where they want to go. Um, last time there was a question about TLS and I, I, I think I didn't answer the question well because I didn't fully understand it, but I believe the question was sort of along the lines of, uh, what security is being provided uh, by TLS and versus what does the application layer uh, need to provide? And so assuming that's a correct understanding of the question, uh, we talked about it a little, and I'm going to let Raul uh, answer it, but we have an answer for that. And if, that's not the, if that wasn't the question uh, you were trying to ask, then uh, after this, just, just fire away with whatever, uh, whatever the real question was. So. Raul? Yeah, I uh, wanted to confirm, was that, was that a question <laughs> to begin with? <laughs> like we want to differentiate, we want to differentiate what, why transport level encryption and authentication and security in general is necessary versus application level uh, crypto? Um, I think there maybe was some misunderstanding on the call, but I, I think everyone could, uh, would love just a quick on, on yeah. this question here. Of course. So uh, transport level security is necessary to be able to, first of all, not be subject to man in the middle attacks uh, that could uh, potentially alter the payload that's being transmitted, uh, to be able to authenticate the peer that you, that you, uh, that you are interfacing with. Um, if you, for example, have a key, a public key for that peer, then by authenticating them when initiating the connection and handshaking, you're, you're able to certify that you're really speaking to them. Uh, of course, for you know all kinds of uh, uh, reasons to avoid observability and censorship and so on, uh, encryption is necessary as well at the transport layer. And of course, if the application itself needs to use crypto primitives to, for example, uh, sign specific pieces of, of data as uh, by specific roles or nodes in the network, like validators and so on, then you could imagine very easily imagine a message, and I think this is the case, uh, where you have a piece of data, a transaction, a set of uh, a block or uh, a collation or whatever that is signed by a particular validator, and uh, that message is gossiped through the network. So as is being gossiped through the network, the transport security would be uh, 
making that message, the, the actual transmission of that message secure between peers, but those peers would need to verify that the origin of that initial message is actually the validator that they expect to, 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 to be. So that would be an application level signature, for example. So, I mean, these are, there are both, yeah, one doesn't exclude the necessity of the other, essentially. And the reason yes. why we are, there are two reasons why we want to adopt TLS 1.3. One of them is that, is that it's a prerequisite for quick. Um, and that is super important. Uh, on the other hand, TLS, adopting TLS 1.3 would uh, help a lot as well with censorship resistance. Uh, if we, you can very easily imagine a transport that is uh, when HTTP uh, 1.3, uh, sorry, HTTP 3 is deployed in real life, uh, you could easily imagine a transport that mimics uh, being HTTP 3 by using Quick uh, with TLS 1.3 uh, over port 443, for example. So therefore, you know, it would be very difficult for, for sensors to actually uh, block traffic uh, unless, you know, at least do conduct any, any kind of deep backend inspection. Uh, of course, they can always block IP addresses. So that, that's another reason why we want to adopt TLS 1.3. The libp 2 b stack is designed for pluggability at the security level, at the secure channel level, which means that another algorithm, another, another approach, another secure channel that we're looking into very seriously is, is noise. Uh, we have some experiments in this department. Um, there are teams that we're actually probably going to be funding a team as well to, to implement uh, some primitives that are lacking in the JavaScript environment to be able to conduct noise uh, in a very, uh, in, 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 in not user land essentially. So that would be, uh, in, like if, if you want me, I can, I can go down into like why we're interested in noise and particularly what handshakes, but basically, we're probably looking at a system where we can conduct the IX or the IK handshake based on what data we have available by the, the parent so Does noise provide some clear benefits over SecIO? <sighs> yeah, yeah, it does. Um, so one of the clear benefits that I personally am very excited about is that it allows us to send push data on the first message and as the handshake is being completed or it's going through the different steps, it, the, any push data or any accessory data that is uh, conveyed in any of those handshake message, messages uh, acquires different levels of security based on the state of that handshake. So you can imagine on an IX uh, handshake, for example, the first initiate a message to the peer, uh, that accessory data would be, or that push data would be plain text. But then if the other peer wants to push back, so if the responder wants to push back any data, then on that second, on, on the response, uh, because there's already crypto, enough cryptographic material to secure that push data, it would be, uh, it would be encrypted. So it, it makes for a very elegant, uh, I like this, DLS 1.3 also provides this, uh, this ability, but for example, in Go, it's not, I, I don't think the Go SDK is capable of sending zero round trip data yet. Uh, it should be on the roadmap, but noise does already. So, and there is a variant of Quick as well that uses noise for its handshakes. It's called NQuick. So, I mean, I do see some very interesting developments there um, and major adoption by projects that uh, definitely have, you know, important reputation. So I'm pretty confident with this. Okay, is it, so it's relatively mature? Probably a little, would you say it's more mature than a SecIO and more widely adopted? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say SecIO was necessary uh, in the early days of libp 2 p but we definitely want to move away from SecIO. That is, just say SecIO is pretty trivial to implement. Um, and for a best baseline interoperability across libp 2 p implementations, you want to implement SecIO because this is what all libp 2 p implementations support. And for example, for the JVM implementation, this is exactly what we're doing. Uh, not all programming languages support TLS 1.3 yet, so that is something against the state of TLS 1.3 uh, at this point. But there's practically a noise library uh, for every language out there. So it would, it would make for a very good, you know, second baseline uh, um, encryption mechanism. Cool. 
Yeah. I, I, I would, I would add, just add. I would just add one more thing. Um, SecIO, as of right now, has not been, not been security audited. Uh, that'll actually probably change by the end of the year. But uh, these other protocols, like Noise, uh, I believe, has undergone a, it's like a formal verification. And TLS 1.3, obviously, it's an IETF standard. Um, so you know, there is that to consider as well. Got it. Thanks. Uh, um, pe people, users will be able to uh, choose which implementation they'd like, right? Yeah, uh, correct. Uh, so in parallel with all of this, there is an ongoing re-architecture of uh, multi-stream uh, to right now the selection of the encryption channel is being conducted in plain text, which is not great, uh, but it does allow for that that pluggability, so peers negotiate on yeah. what on what secure channel they wanna they wanna adopt for that connection. This will probably move to the multi adder as a component of the multi adder. So you can imagine a multi adder like IP IP four the the IP address slash TCP slash the port number slash segio uh, or uh, noise IK or TLS one point three. So that would allow peers to directly initiate a secure channel without having to conduct any plain text negotiation out in the open, which makes the system prone to deep packet inspection and censorship by way of that. Uh, TLS 1.3 is also vulnerable to say channel. Vulnerable too? Um, like uh, side channel leaks, um, they don't break the RSA the exchange. Uh, I don't know, that's nothing, that's whatever. Yeah, uh, from the point of view of the P2P, we would be uh, basically implementing and adopting probably a SDK um, library in each language you probably want to do that like you want to adopt an SDK like you want to make sure that the language has a support data support for for 1.3 um, so yeah we are like the P2P as a user of TLS 1.3 is you know vulnerable to anything that TLS 1.3 itself is vulnerable to for sure Okay, let's uh, keep moving unless there's any other questions for Raul or Mike. Oh yeah, I have a, I have a quick question. Um, so I think uh, Mike mentioned in the beginning that y'all are, um, um, y'all are, y'all are providing a, a lot of funding and support for new implementations, which is badass because that obviously helps um, several of the teams. I was curious about, um, uh, about like testing. What's the um, what's the status on on that and, and what we need to do in order to ensure that um, um, then you know lib P2P and the gossip protocol are, are production ready. I know like um, y'all main like our timeline for ETH two might be slightly different um, than uh, lib P2P, and so I'm curious so uh, what y'all's thoughts are on that if. If there's going to be a grant or or whatnot. Yeah. Um, so we think of the testing in two different. There, there's two aspects of it. One is the interoperability testing between the different languages, and that's an area where we are very interested in making a grant. Uh, we we have a rudimentary system called IPTV, which we think could orchestrate interoperability tests, but we need. Uh, we would need some help, uh, I mean, some, somebody with some time uh, to actually turn it into a proper interop test suite, uh, which could also be used to validate that a particular lib P2P implementation meets the minimum, uh, you know, the minimum requirements necessary to be called lib P2P, whatever, whatever that means exactly. Um, the, the other side of testing is what I think you're getting at, Johnny, um, uh, like, sort of production readiness testing, uh, basically um, integrate integration tests of the whole system to get 
uh, data on uh, performance and uh, you know longevity tests. So leave, it, leave it running, see if it can uh, if it rolls over or not. And for that, we've built a system uh, that we call Test Lab. Um, you can look at it. It's uh, GitHub slash uh, P2P slash Test Lab, L A B. Um, and basically, what it is is uh, um, it's a an, an orchestrator built on top of Nomad, uh, for those of you who um, are interested in container orchestrators. And what it does is uh, spin up large numbers of libp2p nodes, so like a thousand nodes. Uh, it probably, given enough hard work, it could probably go beyond that. Uh, and that that's our plan for testing, uh, you know, real world like production scenarios. Um, we, yeah, we, we would be open to a grant if someone wants to build out that test suite. Uh, we, ha we do have an engineer at Protocol Labs who uh, work on that. Uh, so there's a couple options there, but we, we haven't made any uh, decision yet. We're open to, we're open to proposals. And, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like you have this, um, so uh, like a, a test suite to verify like interoperability between implementations. Um, that, like maybe that needs some some work on it, but that's badass. That'll be super helpful. Um, as far as like the performance testing, so y'all um, y'all built something on top of Nomad so that you can um, but spin up a bunch of nodes and containers and then um, and and do some performance testing because we I, I think it would be wise if we could um, you know what's performant for us may or may not be um, what's performant for y'all like maybe y'all have higher requirements than we do but it would be it would be nice to be able to do um, you know do sweeps on on things like you know message rates um, packet size bandwidth limitations um, like how fast we need no you know like actual gossip messages to propagate through the network just so that we're um, you know, we're aware um, of where things break down because there's always, um, there's always, you know, options, you know, if something needs to be tweaked, we can fix it. So I, I feel strongly that that, like for ETH2, like we really, really, really should focus on that. So um, is that something that y'all would have funds to, um, to work on as well? Yeah, I think we're open to funding something in that area. I guess we, we've started out with sort of the idea that we need to support language implementers first and so um, or, or people fixing uh, deficiencies in the existing languages. So that's kind of why we're, we, we well, you know, yeah. I don't it want to test things on the back burner, but it, well, it's not the first burden. Yeah. Yeah. EF also is uh, interested in funding such work. Um, let's and there's a couple of proposals under evaluation and trying to figure out the best way to move forward. But let's maybe take this offline. Um, I very much agree, Johnny, that we should be doing this as well. Okay, just just I, one, I, I, I just wanted to say one just one last thing real quick. Like if um uh, makes sense that they want to do the interoperability kind of stuff first. Um, but but we have this deadline. Um, uh, of you know like of of january 3rd and and I, I, maybe we could offline talk about um how everyone feels like like realistically like can, can we play out some different scenarios and see like with these tests um with a long-running test net like how realistic is it really is january 3rd uh um really gonna january happen? 3rd was the suggestion okay that obviously it's a nice target but it's not that's not a deadline um, and I want to okay. tell the reporters that are listening to this that is not a deadline um, and that is something that is more in the hands of implementers than it is even in the hands of uh, the researchers so um, you know that that was purely a suggestion um, and something that is maybe feasible but not that there's a lot you know I expect to be uh, the last mile to be long. There's a lot of things, a lot of little things. So I, I don't want to harp in on that January 3rd date as a deadline that exists uh, because there's a lot of things we're, we're juggling right now and a lot of unknowns. Yeah. So it, it's just, um, I'm not one of those groups, but like, um, you know, obviously I'm a model of sensitivity here, but like I would imagine that groups that get 
um, you know, their funding from the EF, they hear January 3rd and they're like, okay, shit, we have to do everything possible, you know, not to do that. And it's just, you know, I think that the focus should, you know, like you obviously have like a good push date, but like no one should be like, um, you, you know, we should logically think about like what's realistic so that we can test everything and, you know, and do it methodically. But, um, you, you know, maybe y'all are already thinking that I'm just saying it out loud. So just FYI. Yeah. We'd like right. to do it quickly, but more importantly, we'd like to do it right. I mean, the January 3rd suggestion was very tentative and I think it was mostly to try and avoid uh, the, uh, the December holidays. So basically it would be, we wouldn't launch before January 3rd. Uh, January 3rd onwards uh, could make sense. What I have done um, is um, survey some of the uh, implementers to ask them uh, if they think they would be production ready in 2019 for launch on January 3rd. And uh, two of the teams uh, have responded positively with optimism um, that it is possible. So at the end of the day, we only need, uh, you know, a, or we need a minimum of, of two clients uh, to be ready and, uh, and we'll see how, how the, the landscape evolves kind of organically. But for sure, I'm not expecting uh, the majority of the clients to necessarily be ready on, on, in 2019. Okay, I, I would, I'm curious. I don't. I don't believe you reached out to us, and I'm curious what the exactly what the um, uh, what we're defining ready as. Like, are are we saying that um, there's going to be a, a three month long um, multi client test net starting in um, September? Um, you know, so that we can you, you know that we can uh, kind of sort out any bugs that are found. And if so, like that means that that, te that multi-client test net is going to run flawlessly for three months. Um, and then we immediately go live and that just seem, it just seems improbable. So like, um, um, I, that's just my thinking. Um, uh, I think all of us could push really hard and make January 3rd, but um, it's just, uh, it's dangerous in my opinion. Um, so um can i can i say something yep okay cool so uh we've been working with uh um prism and a few different other teams um renee's been working on implementing hobbits um we're planning on doing a kind of like an impromptu meeting in toronto next week for anybody that's around uh i think it's going to be um preston and renee and dean um greg chain safe guys i think anton might be joining us as well so if anybody else is interested we're going to kind of start ironing out some of the networking stuff mm -hmm. and trying to come up with um somewhat of a loose specification for what that stack is going to look like and um next we're going to try to move on to do some research in terms of like data sync and um, um like peer discovery etc so if anyone wants to join us please mm -hmm. please do we'll be in toronto next week also, um, we have a few, like Johnny mentioned, we have a few updates to the Hobbit spec that largely came out of the conversation with um, Prismatic. Um, so I'm going to post a link right now, and any feedback is welcome. OK, there's a couple of things on the agenda I want to get to before we get to the hour and a half mark. And then we can come back to open discussion. Um, Greg from Chainsafe suggested that we have a proposal to move to, to make communications to Discord. Um, primarily, we communicate in one getter. There's a couple, you know, maybe two, three getters that we communicate in. And then there's like tons of fragmented telegram communications and emails and things like that. Um, the proposal is to have a more unified place to talk. Um, one of the main downsides uh that i've seen is it's just is a little bit more overhead to come in eavesdrop participate uh because you do have to create a username and login uh so uh, kind of i think the minimum requirement for me is to bridge the current sharding getter to like the general room on this discord but otherwise it seems like people are generally very positive about this is anyone not 
I would like to speak up. Yeah, I, I like bridges too. I mean, add a bridge to a telegram as well. Cool. Yeah, if we could bridge it to telegram, that would be perfect. Does that does that exist? Bridging. Yeah, Discord and that would imply that a lot of us probably don't have to download yet another messaging app. Let's just make a new messaging app that default bridges them all. It's called Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> we are now moving to Riot. I'm I'm joking. I don't have Riot. I don't intend to download it. I'm kind of I'm at the max. But anyway, um, I it, let's do it. I think this is good. I think it makes sense. Um, I know Proto said he would help us do that. So um, Proto, let's talk after this call. Um, cool. And then Proto has a proposal for standardizing, I think, graffiti use case and testing. Proto, do you want to give a quick on that? Sure. So the idea here is that you can use this one field that can contain any data in the block body to use it for debugging during testing. So you can put like this little meta information in it about who is like what kind of client is running or producing the block, uh, where is the client located, uh, for how long is it running, all these kinds of meta information, metadata. And then be able to easily debug like large amounts of blocks. And oh, sounds great. What we yeah, essentially need good. from others is to all agree on the same format. Hello? Yeah. Um, okay, so I... what I want to try to achieve is like collect suggestions from all the other clients on what data they can provide and what would be useful for interrupt testing. And then uh, standardize it or like somewhat standardize it. It doesn't persist after the test nuts, just for testing. Um, yeah. Maybe we should open uh, an issue on uh, the spec test repo. And we can, everyone can add uh, ideas because uh, 32 bytes is, uh, it's large and small at the same time. For example, IP addresses, you need four bytes at minimum. And um, well, we can run out easily. Yes, let's say like client vendor, a timestamp, or maybe two timestamps, uh, some statistics, and an IP address, it would be like just a set of four bytes each. It will fit in 32 bytes. Generally, I'd say that the client version is more important than also the client anything version. else. So maybe uh, like, you know, the first four, four or eight bytes of the Git hash. Cool. Okay, let's uh, take this to an issue. Yep, so Definitely. maybe like yeah. the last uh, few bytes. You cut out a little bit. The last few bytes, what? Oh, my internet is unstable. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay, let's just take this to an issue. Thank you, Proto. Um, okay, before we have just open discussion, just with the, are there any pressing questions about the specification, things that have come up, um, any issues you've run into? Okay, great. Um, and now, open discussion, closing remarks. Clearly, uh, there is a desire to um, figure out the minimum requirements to be production ready. Some of this is a little fuzzy because there's a lot of unknown unknowns that we're going to run into in the next 
uh, four or five months. But it's probably worth at least beginning to enumerate the the knowns there. So um, why don't we take that to an issue in the E2 PM repo, and we'll just start a list, and then we can from there engage in the conversation. Um, does that seem reasonable? Um, a list of unknown unknowns? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, I'm just new, new, yeah, yeah. But, but new, like, how long do we need a, a test net before we feel comfortable? Um, do we need to do some incentivized test nets before we are ready? Um, what sort of performance metrics and stress testing do we need to see on the network layer? Things like that. Um, there are a bunch of things that maybe we can't quite enumerate today because we haven't hit them. But we, there are some things that we should we should get out and start uh, just kind of so that as we move into this uh, interrupt networking phase, we're not blind. Uh, and thank you, Johnny, for you know beginning that conversation. Yeah, I'm not as mean as I sound. I promise. No, it's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, is Joseph here? So long. Is there any update on something that's supposed to be happening in the second week of September? The interop thing? Um, I see him typing on Telegram. Okay. Well, uh, it's, it should uh, still be the, the 6th through the 13th. Um, okay. So uh, I will have him. Um, I don't know, message everyone on uh, the 18 different channels that we have. Well, yeah, I, I know there's somewhat of a cap at some point. I don't know if we're going to hit it, but I, I think for planning purposes, if we can start figuring out an RSVP sometime in the next couple of weeks, that'd be useful just so people can get stuff firmly on their calendars. Okay, yeah, uh, I think he's perfect for the presentation. I'm sorry, it, he'll, I'll have him reply. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Thank you. He, he tells me that he will go updates for like the interrupt on like the next, uh, next like call. So like okay. he'll have all the details by then. Two weeks. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, no, that's that's not right. I'm sorry. He, he's you know he's doing a presentation. Like that's what he's prepping for. So invites are going out today, three to four. Uh, per team and it's September 6th through 13th. Um, so thank you, Johnny. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else? We have a few more minutes before we close. Okay, I got some PRs to do, to work on in this uh, last little sprint before Sunday. Um, great, thank you everyone. Um, I will be sending that release out on Sunday. Appreciate it, talk to you all soon. Uh, and I'll get the recording up. I'm in pretty terrible internet right now, but I've recorded it locally. I will get it up as soon as possible. Thanks guys. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Vultures.